You can submit comments online or you can use the forms. So there's forms on the table here, there's forms again in the narthex, uh, or you can go online and submit comments. We want to hear both the good and the bad comments. And if you got some bad and with some good, we want to hear that as well. Um, so just to get started, welcome again to the 475 public hearing. And uh, we're at the Epworth United Methodist Church, so I do want to thank uh, the United Methodist Church for hosting us today. It's a good setup uh, with, the, with good parking. Uh, this is actually the second uh, public meeting that we're having. We have one at 2.30, and we also have a house format to accommodate uh, more people. Um, these projects, uh, projects like this take uh, years, if not decades, to work on. And, and you'll see uh, through the presentation that Initially, this was talked about back in 2002 with the team of COG uh, study, and we felt that right now it's currently the right time in the process to kind of get enough new information to share with the public and talk with uh, talk with what we have right now. I haven't said that we don't have all the answers, and when you look at it, even three years ago, we might have been looking at a 50,000 foot view, and maybe we're at a 20 or 15,000 foot view now, but we're not at a 100 foot view. But there are certain answers we have today that we can address, and some of those like, specific questions um, would come as the process continues. Uh, I do want to introduce our team that will be talking today. So Manning Smith Group was the consultant that was selected on this project. So with Manning Smith Group, we have Jason Watson, uh, their sub-consultant, Aaron Grillo. Got that right again, it's called Grilly Cox, I think, but uh, it's French, so Grilly Hill. So he's with Trans Systems, and they are a sub-consultant to Nathan Smith. And then Dave Jekyll is our project manager for ODOT. We also have Kelsey Hogan in the back, she's our public information officer. Uh, so those, those are the folks that we participate in. And again, there's many others in the Narthex that's able to answer questions. If you want to talk specifically more one-on-one -on -one with somebody, maybe not in public format, they're out there to, to uh, address questions and, and go through those, some of those displays. So one of the things that we received, in, both in 2020, though we've gotten a lot of comments uh, along the way, had to deal with right-of-way impacts. And with this project, uh, again, looking at a 50,000 foot view, there were some potential full uh, right-of-way acquisitions that be required, or in other words, houses to be taken. And we really, with those comments, we've tasked and talked about, really tasked our consultant and our teams to leave no stone unturned to make sure that we eliminate or at least reduce total right-of-way acquisitions, would be, which again would be houses that's being taken. I, I'm pleased to report to you that they have uh, they have they have really worked, especially in those constrained areas. And there will be no houses taken with this project, no houses required to be taken. So we're very happy to report that today. Um, but uh, a few other things that got to get my clicker here. So um, wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of different committees that are in place. So we have our steering committee. And we also have our stakeholders list. So our student committee uh, in general is, is, is really more entities that have like assets that we're touching or potential financial contributors could represent those potential financial contributors. So in general, that's like Team ACAW, which is the Toledo Metropolitan Area Council of Governments. There are a metropolitan planning organization for both Wood County and Lucas County, as well as government agencies like the Metro Parks, the Township, uh, the City, um, those type of individuals are on the steering committee. Uh, we also have a stakeholders list. So this stakeholders list was developed to try to incorporate and represent the community as much as possible. So that would include elected officials. Uh, elected officials would be your city council members. It could be the mayor. It could be your county, the county engineer. It is the county engineer. It is all these people. The county commissioners are another entity on there. Um, but uh, and then we also have uh, police departments, fire departments, who have a stake in this. Uh, TARDA, the library, uh, healthcare communities, but then we also, we have places to worship on there. So obviously the places to worship where we run right now are very ingrained into the community. Many people use their, um, go to them as a place of gathering. So those are also stakeholders. Having said that, so we have a number of people on the stakeholders list. This stakeholders list is not all inclusive. We try to make it as inclusive as possible, but we are identifying organizations that best represent the community or elected officials that you have all elected. That also includes uh, general assembly members as well. 
So if, if you know or if you're wondering, hey, is, is an organization I'm part of part of the stakeholders list? We do have a stakeholders list out there. It's actually on the table. Uh, please feel free to, to review that and see if you have an entity that you're curious about is on the stakeholders list. But also, if you are a member uh, of a group and you want to be added and you're not already added, as far as that group having representation on there or a delegate of that group, uh, feel free to, if you know the person that would be a delegate, in this case, like in churches, it's generally you know, the pastors or the priests or things like that. Um, we also want to make sure we're including other groups that are representative of this area, so we'd be happy to take the contact information and add them to that stakeholders list. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Watson uh, with Manikin Smith, and we're going to start the presentation. And again, thank you very much for coming out today. Thank you, Pat. And I'm not sure if Matt introduced himself. That's Pat McCauley, ODOT District 2's District Deputy Director. Um, as Pat mentioned, we'll be going into some more detail on the project here. I'd like to do a brief overview of our agenda before we get underway. Uh, first, we'll be talking about uh, project location and history. Uh, so this project is part of the I-475 loop around the greater uh, Toledo metropolitan area and uh, was designed and constructed in the 1960s. We'll talk a little bit more about the history and how we got here uh, in a little bit. Uh, next, we'll be talking about the purpose and need, which is the why for the project. So the purpose and need for this project is to reduce congestion and improve safety. That's the primary goal for this project. Following that, we'll be talking about project considerations. Uh, how we got to where we're at, what we've looked at, and um, develop a little bit more background for you all here tonight. Then we'll move into proposed alternatives. You know, with those considerations we've reviewed through feasibility studies, planning studies, uh, a multitude of, of different configurations that we'll go through uh, at a high level and get a little more detail as we continue the discussion. Once we complete that part of the discussion, we'll go into the next steps talk about uh, what the future holds as we progress through the project, and then open it up to questions as we move forward. So, uh, a little bit about the project location. Uh, this is I-475 between the US-23 475 systems interchange to the west, all the way to Douglas Road, or just west of Douglas Road on the east end, for a project length of a little over four and a half miles. In addition to the uh, mainline operation, which is an advance there, um, we're also covering uh, many interchanges to the project. So the, as I mentioned, the US 23 I-475 systems interchange, at least the eastern portion of that interchange, will go through some uh, updates. And then the full interchange at Secor Road, and then the partial interchanges at Quarry Road, Talmadge Road, and Monroe Street. And each of those interchanges have a bridge associated with them. That makes up part of the 11 overpasses and underpasses. And those bridges that were not included in the interchanges include the Norfolk Southern Railroad Bridge, just west of Holland, Sylvania. Then the Holland, Sylvania uh, Bridge, the bridges over the Iowa River, uh, just north of Wildwood Preserve. And then uh, Woodley, Rushland, and Bow. A little bit more on the history. Oops, I hit the wrong button here. Um, so, as Pat mentioned, these, these projects take up, can take up to decades to come to fruition. So, in 2002, uh, TMACOG procured a study to begin the analysis of what the future holds for the 475 corridor. Uh, we knew that this project, again, was constructed in the 1960s, uh, in the next couple of decades, moving towards the end of its useful life. And that study culminated in the development of a strategic plan developed by ODOT in 2006. This strategic plan prioritized improvements um, throughout the corridor, the 475 corridor, from the south end of the 75 interchange by 25, all the way up around uh, the Toledo metropolitan area to that uh, other connection on the north side of 475 and 75. On the right side of your screen, you'll see that uh, there's a summary of the recent projects. You're probably all familiar with 
um, all the work that has occurred over the last uh, six to seven years. Again, work that's ongoing uh, through the projects highlighted, project A, B, and C, which have some subset projects within them. But uh, that has set the stage for where we're headed with the uh, I-475 East-West Improvement Project. Something like three lanes and capacity uh, to address those capacity issues. Um, these projects are developed in what we call a uh, segment of independent utility, so they can operate independently, they can be funded um, and developed based on need. So where we've gotten to today has led to the development of the 2020 feasibility study that was procured under project identification number 108778. I highlight that because that is essentially the project's unique social security number. So each project throughout the build-out phase, whether it's planning or design, will receive a project identification number. So while that number may change as we go from one phase to another, um, the project is consistent and it's based on the funding schedule and need. So again, that feasibility study in 2020 was developed under PID 108778. And it evaluated a no-build scenario along with multiple third lane uh, op build options. And those results were funded, uh, funded, those were developed and described in that study. In August of 2020, there was a public information that was held. And many of the comments that were uh, procured during that meeting were incorporated and considered as part of the final um, feasibility study that was produced in November of 2020. I do want to highlight that uh, as a result of the public feedback and the results in the feasibility study, that feasibility study did lead to the removal of a proposed full interchange in Talmadge. So the configuration you see today with the westbound exit ramp and the eastbound entrance ramp of Talmadge will continue to be maintained. There will be no additional uh, entrance, eastbound entrance and west, or eastbound exit and westbound entrance added to that interchange as part of this project. So as we migrate from the 2020 study that provided a preferred recommended alternative, that allowed us to go to the next, next state, stage of this project uh, under PID 115418, or the I-475 East-West Improvement Project. And what this project does is it further examines the alternatives for the 2020 draft feasibility study. And it also is reviewing specific areas for additional study. And those areas include, uh, but may not be limited to, Quarry, Talmadge, and C Quarry Interchange. We'll be looking at alternatives. And you, if you haven't been upstairs yet, there are boards that show those alternative, potential alternatives uh, for those areas. In addition to that, building upon the 2020 feasibility study, there were preferred alternatives, uh, we recommended preferred alternatives, will provide the following. Um, to hit that purpose of need. Uh, Aaron's going to talk more about the purpose of need here real soon, but that purpose of need again is to reduce congestion and improve safety. In addition to that, we provide better multimodal access on bridges. So multimodal is defined as additional sidewalks, wide sidewalks, wide piece paths, and then some other elements that we'll be concerned again that Aaron will uh, be looking at in more detail, including some status and treatments. Uh, to improve those pedestrian connections or those multimodal connections, uh, which then leads to you know reconnecting uh, communities on both sides of 475, you know better access, um, more space, uh, so they can ride your bike or, or walk across those bridges. Um, not to mention the bridge improvement, improvements that go along with that. So new bridges to replace those aging structures on the corridor, and then uh, an analysis of noise walls. So I'll go into more uh, on the noise walls a little bit later, but those were uh, put in as the basis. And the last is Pat mentioned, no total residential base, and, and really the goal to minimize residential impacts. So with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Aaron Grillo to uh, talk a little bit more about the purpose of need or the why on the project. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> So as Jason mentioned, you know, with each project, there's a purpose and need statement that's developed 
that, that as he said, is, is really the why. You know, what, what is the reasoning? What is the justification? Why are we doing this project? So as you can read here, uh, for this stretch, stretch of Interstate 475, it's really looking at congestion and safety opportunities as those primary needs for this project. I'm going to take a few minutes here and just walk through a few slides that kind of speak to some of those elements that are behind this purpose and need statement. So if you see the image on the right of the screen, this is what's called a permanent traffic count station. Uh, some of you may have driven by it many times and not even noticed it was there, but it's, it's located just east of the Woodley overpass if you're going westbound on 475. And this went into operation in 2008, and what it does is it collects traffic data 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, year round. So since that point in time, ODOT's had very reliable traffic counts in this stretch of the corridor to understand you know, how those volumes have fluctuated over the years. And what we've seen is a steady increase in that traffic over that last 15 or 16 year period. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, I want to just kind of point out how traffic can, can vary. So during the month of August, the lowest traffic count was just under 60,000 vehicles, and that was on a Sunday, so typically on the weekends, the amount of traffic is a little bit lower than it is during the weekdays. But then there was a high count on a Friday in August of over 93,000 vehicles. So you can see there's a very wide spread that occurs. And this just doesn't happen during a week or a month. It happens over the course of the year. So when we talk about average daily traffic, it's really averaging those counts over the course of the entire year to come up with you know, what that, that normalized number would be. And so in this case, what I'll show on the next slide is, is some information that, that kind of balances out what we're seeing here. But I do want to put it into perspective, this range of say you know, 60 to 90,000 vehicles this is fairly consistent to the 475 and 75 corridor in the Toledo area, and in many of those locations, it's already been widened to three or four lanes in each direction. So you know, we're seeing this amount of traffic within this stretch of the corridor that's just two lanes in each direction. So let's see if my pointer works here. So this blue box on the screen that I'm highlighting here. That represents the location of that permanent count station. And so while it's picking up data on mainline I-475, ODOT's able to go out and get counts at each of the ramp locations where people are getting on and off of the freeway. And that allows them to get a very good handle on how traffic you know, varies throughout the corridor. So you'll see over here to the right, this is around the Monroe interchange. So this is at the eastern end of where this project would end and tie in near Douglas. The average daily traffic, and I should point out, this is from last year, so this is 2022 data, was a little over 81,000 vehicles. And then within the Secor interchange, so you've got ramps with traffic getting on and off, it's a little over 72,000. And then here at our permanent count station, we have a value of over 74,000. So if you think back to the previous slide, I talked about how those values vary over the course of the year. We've got a 74,000 average daily traffic volume at that location. Now, you'll see that the traffic volume does decrease here between Quarry Road and Talmadge. And the reason for that is that that's what we call a split interchange. So you can get on and off to and from the west at the quarry interchange, and then get on and off to and from the east at Talmadge. So you know, many interchanges have all those ramps at one location. Here they're kind of split. So there's nobody actually getting on 475 in between those two. So that's why that value is lower at 56,000. But then as you move further to the west, you'll see that it's up over 67,000 again as traffic is approaching the interchange with US 23. So when we have that information, that, that 
helps inform some of the analysis we do in looking at the level of traffic demand and congestion on the corridor. And so this exhibit here represents the year 2045. So when we have a project of this magnitude, we're not just looking at current traffic counts today, we're also looking out into the future so that if you make that investment, you're able to you know, get some extended you know, life out of that project. So typically, we want to look out at these 20 years and make sure that any improvements not only meet today's demands, but also those in the future. So what this exhibit shows is it's color-coded here where uh, green is, is good, if you will, red is bad. So if you think of like a, a stoplight, uh, green means go. So the areas in green are basically those locations that are forecasted have very little, if any, congestion. So pretty much your free flow conditions, you're able to travel freely, change lanes. Where you see the red, which is largely concentrated between Talmadge and Secor, that particular segment is indicating the highest level of congestion. So during those peak hours, your, your AM and PM rush hour, that's when you're expecting the most delays or you know, breakdowns in the traffic stream due to those forecasted traffic demands. Where we have the yellow with the orange, that's where we're kind of on that verge, that tipping point where you're starting to see you know, some impacts on your ability to freely change lanes. You know, there's gonna be some periodic stops and delays along the corridor. So again, this is an analysis that's representing the year 2045 and what's anticipated for the current lane configuration out here on 475, which is you know, the two lanes uh, in each direction. So this next slide here is also representing 2045, but what is portrayed is if we add that additional lane in the eastbound and westbound direction, so there's three travel lanes, you're going to see that the majority of that corridor turns from yellow, orange, or red to green. So basically indicating that that additional lane is able to accommodate the projected future traffic demand and traffic should operate you know, with, with minimal congestion, if any, in this particular area. So that kind of concludes the, the congestion portion of, of the purpose and need. But I also wanted to speak to the safety elements. And there's a couple of different pieces to this. So one is your reported crashes. And so these are where you know a police officer comes out to the scene and there's a police report that's filed. And so over a three-year period from 2019 to 2021, there were 295 reported crashes that occurred. Now, many of those were rear end or side swipe type crashes. So if you think of you know, traveling behind somebody, traffic slows down, there's some delays, a rear end a crash occurs, or somebody's trying to change lanes, um, maybe getting on and off a freeway uh, entrance or exit ramp, things of that nature. We're seeing those types of crashes, which are typically indicative of some sort of slowdown or, or congestion on the corridor. And of those nearly 300 reported crashes, nearly one quarter, 24%, resulted in either a reported injury or fatality. But in addition to that, you have other incidents that aren't necessarily you know, reported. There's not a police report or something like that. And so if you're familiar with, for example, the GEICO freeway service patrol vehicles that circulate out there on the corridor to deal with you know, various vehicle breakdowns, if there's a car broken down in the lane or on the shoulder, 
you know, things of that nature, somebody's a flat tire. Those incidents are something that ODOT also keeps track of. When we look just over the last two years in this stretch of freeway, and there were more than 1,300 occurrences of those freeway service patrol vehicles responding to an incident. And so when you put that into perspective, well, maybe you don't necessarily experience, you know, a lot of delay on the corridor or during off-peak hours. You know, what I thought was interesting is that those 1,300 incidents result in an additional 35,000 hours of vehicular delay over that time period. So I mean, that's a pretty substantial consideration that we're also taking into account along with those reported crashes. So what this image is here is something we call a heat map, and it's basically showing just a concentration of where those 295 reported crashes are. It's only reflecting those, those particular incidents. But the locations in yellow are where those highest concentrations of those police reports are concentrated. And as you can see, many of those are associated with where you have those freeway ramps located, where people are getting on and off of the freeway. And so as you have people making those decisions, switching lanes, merging onto or off of the mainline lanes, that's typically where you have more of those conflict point, points, and that's what's reflected in this exhibit here. So Jason talked about you know, the purpose needs, those primary needs being congestion and safety, but there is another tier to that, and, and, and that's something that we're looking at as a secondary need. And as many of you know that you know, live in Traverse the area, you know, 475 does essentially bisect the community on each side. And so with all these bridges that are spanning over 475 that are being considered for improvement and replacement as part of this project, we really look at it as a way to help reconnect the communities. And so this image here is actually from Columbus. This is a newer bridge that was built over Interstate 71. And just looking at it, you might not realize that it's, it's a bridge over an interstate. And so, you know, as part of this process while we're here today, you know, we want to get feedback. You know, as, as you look at some of the exhibit boards that are out in the lobby there, you know, we would like to see where it makes sense to maybe do something more than just having a pedestrian sidewalk on a bridge. Are there some other amenities or features that we can reasonably incorporate into those bridge replacements in order to you know, create something maybe similar to this in some of those locations where we're accommodating pedestrians and bicyclists, but also maybe creating some other features where, you know, as you use that bridge, you don't even realize that you're walking over a freeway. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jason. All right, continuing on, uh, some of the elements that have where we are today and the, and the how is when we look at the project today, the current conditions have I-475 as a two-wing configuration from just east of the US-23 systems interchange to Monroe Street. And once we hit Monroe Street, we basically add that third lane that matches up with the uh, segment of I-475 running the parkway all the way to 75. Now, many of the elements with the element we talked about before with the project A and B that have recently been completed have three lanes. So there'd be consistency and, and developing that moving forward. So the project was designed and built in the 1960s and it's ending the end of its useful life in terms of pavement. Standards have been outdated, you know, through research over the years and additional uh, analysis. Standards have continuously been updated by the Federal Highway Administration. And as we look at this project, it provides an opportunity to not only, you know, replace the pavement, but upgrade the facility to meet those standards uh, that are current. And I'll go over more of that here in just a second. Uh, before we do that, uh, one of the elements that uh, is, is integral with the project, we do have a two-lane configuration with a very thin median shoulder, inside shoulder. That shoulder is approximately four feet wide. It may be difficult to see up here, but uh, uh, 
Uh, off to the left here, this is a recent photo taken on the corridor, driving along the inside lane as you approach Quarry Road. Uh, and in the next frame, you see a car just off into the distance here. Now, when you widen the shoulder, that will provide more sight distance. You'll be able to see if that car happened to be disabled, broken down, stuck in that lane, or pulled off into that substandard shoulder. Uh, it would be hanging out. You would have less time to react to that car being stopped. So uh, seeing that, processing it, and breaking your vehicle in time, or moving over, looking at that vehicle next to you. So that's one of the intents of this project, to upgrade those elements to provide those, those safety improvements. Now, through the process of the project, you know, we've considered comments received from the 2020 feasibility study that we talked about earlier uh, through continued outreach. Uh, public involvement is ongoing. Uh, many of you may be aware that the publicinput.com website is active. We've been fielding phone calls and emails. We have record of that. We're making, uh, uh, providing responses and incorporating as many of those elements as we possibly can into the report, taking this under consideration. One of the other elements that we're looking at are incorporating those interchange improvements. As I mentioned, the current design criteria um, requires existing exit ramps to be uh, lengthened and widened. So again, as we've moved from the 1960s into the current you know, 2020s, over time, the Federal Highway Administration and ODA have continually looked at and researched the design criteria that we're held to when we design these facilities. And those elements have changed over time. So we're looking at longer acceleration for these updated ramps, wider ramps, so that when you're entering the interstate, for example, you have more time to anticipate the vehicles next to you, accelerate and merge less conflict points. The other thing that we're looking at is to minimize right away and property impacts. As Pat mentioned, there will be no total takes for residential properties. Um, we listened to the concerns voiced during the public 2020 public information period, adjusted townage, interchange accordingly, uh, and we prioritize uh, to minimize those impacts. Next, we'll take a look at the uh, environmental process. So as Pat mentioned earlier, and Aaron mentioned earlier, that purpose and need, the NEPA process, National Environmental Policy Act, basically in addition to that purpose and need, we're considering noise. You may have noticed representatives out in the field recently taking noise analysis uh, on properties. And that's to analyze the whole corridor, how it will treat noise, um, whether it's noise walls or, or whatever that um, process entails, and we'll move forward into a public process, public comment process during the period once those, once that analysis and recommendations are complete. We anticipate that occurring in early 2024. Additional items that the process looks at are air quality, it's a qualitative analysis, section 106, which covers historic properties and archaeological sites. We'll do a field analysis to assess whether there may be any properties or elements that fall under that category. Uh, RMR, which is Regulated Materials Review, so gas stations, landfills, we'll analyze those throughout the corridor and if there's any conflicts, we'll you know, take a look at what it would take to remediate those. And then lastly, ecological. So I mentioned that one of the bridges goes over the Ottawa River. Uh, we have wetlands, streams, sensitive species that might you know, live in the Iowa River. We'll, we'll analyze all that, do an assessment, and determine how to best move forward with those elements. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about the proposed alternatives. So uh, in the 2020 feasibility study, there was a recommended, uh, recommended preferred alternative, a little bit of a tongue twister, um, and we continue to build upon that. So the, as we move from the feasibility study into the design phase, we took a look at three other alternatives. That's the full ODOT criteria, as we're calling it. Alternative two is the hard shoulder running, which uh, basically includes a widened shoulder that would only be used during elements uh, or instances of high traffic and high congestion. Similar facilities located down in Columbus and I-70. So when traffic gets to a certain point, that lane activates, 
and you can take that, that lane. And then lastly, performance-based project development. Uh, this is basically an approach where you look at elements and try to minimize or meet minimum standards. Um, and in our case, the way that that played out, there was added, uh, added little benefit or no benefit really. And the amended feasibility study recommends moving forward with alternative one since alternatives two and three have fewer benefits relative to alternative one. One thing we would like to highlight, um, currently, the Interstate 475 in this segment is posted 65 miles an hour west of Quarry Road, and then east of Quarry Road is posted 60 miles an hour. That speed limit will be maintained as part of this project. We will not be changing the posted speed through the corridor. Next, we'll be talking about the proposal alternative in a little bit more detail here. So I talked about, and I've talked about design standards. So again, we're held to a standard that dictates what these roadways look like, um, from widths to lane configurations. And in this case, the interstate system requires a 12 foot wide lane. So we'll have three 12 foot wide lanes and a minimum 10 foot shoulder. <coughs> in the case of this project, we do have areas where the median shoulder, the inside shoulder, will be wider than 10 feet, up to 14 feet. And that's to accommodate what we call sight distance. So that in that image I showed before, that you can see farther ahead and anticipate if there is a disabled vehicle or emergency vehicle on that shoulder. And those shoulders will permit um, that disabled vehicle or an emergency vehicle, fire, EMS, police, to get into that median shoulder, and there will be less conflicts for through traffic. So that will improve congestion during those times. Since Aaron again mentioned the 1,300 incidents outside of those reported incidents in the last two years, those had a pretty catastrophic impact on traffic flow throughout the corridor. That would help reduce those impacts by having a wider median shoulder. And then lastly, those ramps would be brought up to current standards. Again, they'll be longer and wider. Uh, that will allow uh, you to get on the interstate, anticipate those cars next to you, and merge with greater ease. So that's those are part of the improvements to the proposed alternative. And then in addition, uh, just a quick summary here. Um, the full ODOT criteria for that configuration I just showed you meets the purpose and need uh, to reduce congestion and increase safety. We'll provide three lanes you know, for existing traffic lines and future conditions. Aaron highlighted that we're forecasting to the year 2045 as part of this project and the results that were, would require the additional money to again help with that congestion as we look into the future. Uh, it provides an opportunity to correct design deficiencies. As I mentioned, those ramps and shoulders, they are substandard according to, to today's standards. They met standards when this facility was designed and constructed in the 60s, um, but again, through research and updates, um, we would upgrade the facility to meet the current standards. Travel familiar, that's another big, big item. Um, as you saw, projects A, B, and C on the west end of the 475 corridor, and then the Pro Medica Parkway, all configured to three lanes. This section of 475 is two lanes. You think about if you're driving westbound as you approach Monroe Street, that's what we call lane drop. That lane goes directly to an exit. What we've seen, you saw on the heat maps, is that folks will come up to that, not anticipating the exit, and they'll move over suddenly at the last minute that contributes to those side swipe and rear end accidents that you saw, which are prevalent on this corridor, and then that also contributes to congestion within the corridor. So those items would be uh, eliminated with the addition of the third lane. This meets the full criteria for uh, three lanes on an interstate, as dictated by the Federal Highway Administration. And then again, that wide and medium shoulder, they'll provide that sight distance, provide refuge from disabled vehicles. You know, currently, if you are disabled, out in that lane that causes traffic congestion and safety challenges, and um, that would be addressed as part of this. One additional item that we'd like to touch on tonight is discussion about auxiliary lanes. Um, you may ask what auxiliary lane is, and it's essentially a connecting lane between two adjacent interchanges. You know, for example, uh, out there today, if you get on ProMedica, uh, westbound entrance, you can stay in an auxiliary lane to 
get off of Douglas Road. You don't have to merge with it through traffic. So the, the motivation there is that we have a segment between Towers and Secor where there's a lot of traffic. Aaron pointed that out uh, with his traffic numbers, that there is quite a bit of traffic that enters at Secor, exits at Towers, and vice versa. By adding the Zoria Lane, that traffic that never would never have to engage with the through traffic on 475, that eliminates many of those conflict points, again creating a, a safer roadway. So we're looking at implementing that in both directions, westbound and eastbound, between Talmadge and Seacorp. And uh, as I mentioned again, that there's a similar situation just to the east between Prometica and Douglas. And through all of that, there is no need for additional right of way. We've analyzed that area um, and preliminarily we've determined that just the addition of some smaller retaining walls will avoid any right of way impacts in that stretch. So with that, uh, that wraps up our discussion on the design details that they handed over to Dave Gutko to talk a little bit more, more about the next steps on the project. All right, thanks Jason. Uh, kind of cover here where, where things are going and the next steps of the project. Um, in the middle of 2023, we had an amended feasibility study that was approved. Um, so going forward, uh, we're analyzing that alternative in a little more in detail. Uh, we are at uh, proceeding with stage one plan development, which there's three stages of plan, so we're very early in the process. We have a lot of work to do in, in the stage of the design of the project. Um, we, we are having this informational public meeting today. Uh, the intent is we're going to have another public meeting next spring to discuss our, our design a little farther in a little more detail. Um, we are still studying the interchanges at, at Corey Road, Tommage Road, and Secor Road. So we're still looking at a little more detail on those, and we are very early in the process. So we are gathering comments from individuals uh, at this meeting today uh, through our website. Uh, however, we can get comments to kind of guide this project along. Um, through, uh, again, like I said, the spring of 24, we're looking to have another public meeting. Uh, going 24 and 25, uh, we're going to refine our design. We're going to have our stage three, stage two plans submitted. Um, and then in fall 26, we're looking to uh, Required and needed right away. Again, that does not include any total takes of residential properties. We may need some strip takes here and there to uh, be able to construct our project, but overall, no total takes of residential properties. And then our earliest possible construction is looking at 2027. So that's kind of the next steps of how things are going to progress going forward. Um, with that, uh, we're going to open it up for questions. I want to thank uh, Ampworth and Methodist Church today for having us and hosting us today. It was, uh, it's a very nice facility that's worked out really well. Uh, thank Pat, Jason, and Aaron for their presentation today. Uh, we are going to, Kelsey's going to be our moderator. We're going to open up for questions. If you don't feel comfortable talking in front of the group, we will stay afterwards. Uh, our representatives are also out in the narthex to be able to answer questions, so feel free to step out if you want. Uh, we will open up for questions, and we'll be here to answer those questions. Thanks, David. Um, so as I said, my name is Kelsey Homeland. I'm a public information officer. You call it a TODOT's public line, public information line. It might be me that you've got to hear from or have a conversation with. Uh, we had a really productive, I think, question and answer session earlier. We had a lot of very different questions from the audience. We did uh, pretty good. We did miss one person, so I apologize for that. We're going to need for that to not happen here. But we do have, uh, uh, we've told the church that we'll do our best to get out of this room with, with a hard stop at 7. So uh, we did achieve it just about 45 minutes before, and I already saw a hand up, so we're going to get right to it. Um, I will come to you and hand you the microphone. I'm not going to actually try to hold it again this time around. Um, but we ask that you do keep it concise if you have multiple questions. We ask a couple, and then we'll come back to you if you have additional ones afterward. My question is regarding your crash data that's posted on your website, and I was shocked to see that 54 crashes, which is almost 20% of the total crashes, was um, involved with drivers under 15, and with the driving legal age of 15 and a half, of course these are illegal drivers, children. So I guess my question to you is, is that accurate? And if it is, can we trust the other data that you've provided? And if it is accurate, I'm wondering if we should be addressing that issue. Because that was the, the highest amount of crashes 
in any age group, it was 54. So are we widening a highway to accommodate these actual crimes? Or is this an error? Thank you for the question. Yeah, as, far, as far as the the, the ages, I'm not necessarily aware of what the ages particularly are, but I will say, in generalities, where they get the crash data is from, it's called the Wage One Report, which any police, sheriff, state patrol pulls out with a crash, essentially a crash report, and it goes to the Department of Public Safety. So pretty much all the information that's filled out in that Wage One Report um, by the Toledo Police Department, or Oaks County Sheriff, or Township Police, or the uh, State Patrol, um, goes into those reports, and that's how they're extracted. Uh, and again, those are just reported uh, crashes. Uh, it's a crash report, so it's not necessarily vehicles that are stranded or vehicles that are having issues or those type of things. But I'll I'll let somebody else fill in the rest there. Yeah, thanks, Pat. I mean, I think Pat kind of hit the, the, the point there. I mean, the information that we're working with is, is not information we're going out and, and collecting or gathering. So we're relying on you know, the accuracy of that information that that officer is putting on that OH, OH1 report. So again, I don't think we can really offer any more specifics to that, but I appreciate uh, the comment and bringing that to our attention. Hi, my name is Peggy Dillon Nelson-Nap, and I am the coordinator for the I-475 Neighborhoods Coalition. Unless I'm wrong, I do not see any elected officials in the audience. Am I wrong? Okay. So the folks who need to know this is not a public hearing. A public hearing is in front of an official body where a vote is usually taken. Maybe not that day, but somewhere at some point in time. These people are not accountable to the ballot, and so we need to have a public hearing whenever there's this much money involved. Um, the last numbers that they're admitting to are $186 million, and I challenge anybody to tell me a project in the city of Toledo that was in these kind of numbers. I believe it's over $200 million already from everything I've analyzed for three years to show that this deserves a public hearing when this, uh, the significance of the amount of money is there. Um, I want to ask my question, which is, none of your I-475 expansion plans, which you claim are needed based on safety, will make the highway safer just the opposite. No matter which of the three alternatives you have studied, according to analytics by your own consulting engineer, the expansion will increase the number of fatalities and injuries. The engineer's analytics pages have been duplicated from the material that are found on page 11 through 18, of the Neighborhoods Coalition document, and that data was compiled into a spreadsheet uh, to make it easier to read with the increase of the county injury percentages calculated, and they weren't calculated on your data. Those analytics show an increase in fatalities and incapacitating injuries of between 13 and 29 percent, an increase in serious yet not incapacitating injuries between 4 and 21 percent and an increase in other injuries up to 18%. In fact, ODOT is a participant in a frequently reconvened Ohio Strategic Highway Safety Plan. You and the other participants have set a goal of a 2% yearly reduction in these crashes, all while you were designing a highway which is increasing fatalities and serious injuries. None of the alternatives you are studying are safer, not the widening with the wider shoulders, not the widening using narrower shoulder distances, and not the hard shoulder running alternative. Yet you keep insisting that an unsafe expansion is your only alternative. Why does ODI insist on building an unsafe highway? And please address your own data analytics, not what happened in Columbus or any place else. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I uh, know you're familiar with the information that you're referring to in the amended feasibility study as it relates to the, the crash data. You know, with any project of this scale, we're continually refining and, and looking at that information as we move forward. Uh, the pro projections that we have are showing an overall decrease in total crashes on the corridor. There are some very slight upticks in the injury and fatality categories, and that's something that we are continually looking at. 
because as we move forward with design, we do want to make sure that we are getting those safety benefits that we're striving for as part of this project. So again, that is something that we are going to continue to be investigating as part of our refinement of design moving forward. Thanks, Aaron. We actually have a group of about five folks here, so I'm going to hand off to the first one, and then we'll make sure that everybody's going to be my name is Mary Beth Noyes. Uh, I live over on Devon Hill. And this summer, um, me and some of the other neighbors that are in here tonight, uh, we received notification that uh, possible acquisition of homes along Devon Hill um, and the stretch for the freeway widening, um, but that was possible. And now you're saying that no, there is not going to be any full house acquisitions. I'm curious to hear what, why that was presented or why that was sent out, basically scaring the neighborhood. And I'm happy to hear that that's not necessarily going to be you know, happening, but I'm curious to hear what, how you came to that decision and how you, what changed to, to create you know, where it's not going to happen at this point. And then would there be anything in the future that would change that decision and cause everyone to kind of panic again. Hopefully that makes sense. And so thank you. And Pat, I was just going to add quickly that I think that one of the main reasons that we generated the letter to begin with was to acknowledge that there was a concern in the community we were hearing. We were receiving a lot of feedback at ODOT in our offices and, and representing here in District 2. Uh, that we're really concerned about, oh my gosh, is our house, what is the future of this? What does the timeline look like? What are the possibilities here? And so really I think we identified a need to just send out a letter just so that there was some type of an update. But Pat, if you wanted to expand on, you know, a little bit more about how we got to that place. Yeah, I'll talk more about the specifics of where we are today and how we got there. So I mean, how we got there is, again, I talked about that 50,000 foot view and we're, we're narrowing down the end. I mean, when you build a, a highway and you're trying to fit it in a corridor, there's just a lot of work that goes into it. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. We really tasked the consultant to focus in on those constrained areas that could potentially have those full right-of-way takes and say, hey, why don't you focus your efforts on those areas? And then they were working on this up until last month, I would say, or, you know, it really focuses in on those areas to determine, like, you know, can we try to find some very creative solutions to not take people's houses? So that's what we task them with, and it takes a while, it takes a long while. That's one of the reasons, like, we wanted to have this meeting because we we're getting closer and closer to, like, hey, I don't think we're going to need any of these uh, total uh, right of way acquisitions. And that's why we're having to report that today. So, like, did we know that five months ago? No. Honestly, we didn't know that a month and a half or two months ago. We were getting some good ideas, I would say, and they're probably better to answer this than I am. Uh, but uh, we were getting some good ideas, like, hey, there's a really good possibility we're not going to have to take any uh, houses with this project for total right-of-way acquisitions. And, uh, but we weren't sure yet, because you gotta, we got to fine-tune things, and we got to get from that 50,000 foot to 20,000 to 10, and so on. So that information is relatively new. Um, again, if I would have asked them, and I do, I ask them every week, I think, right? Um, about the total right-of-way acquisitions, it, it was, uh, it's been evolving, but we're at the point where we, we do not need full house uh, acquisitions. I don't know if you guys want to add any more to that. We have a number of questions. We've got about four people, yes, so we've got now five, six, seven, but we're coming. Yep, you're there. I've got you guys. So what if, did you guys in the panel have anything else that you wanted to add with that particular question? Okay, thank you. All right, so next I told, you go ahead, dear. So I have just a couple questions. So one is my house, our house, would be one of the houses that was told that was going to be torn down, okay? Um, the um, James land. And so are you telling us now that that's not going to happen? So what we did is we worked with the city of Toledo uh, to come up with a solution that would allow us to compress those two lands together to make them look like they are today. 
uh, and still accommodate the increased traffic volumes through the intersection of Talmadge and, and those ramps. So we've been able to move the westbound exit ramp back to the south and get those two ramps closer together, which will avoid any takes on, on James Way. Okay, so also um, on the papers that you guys passed out, it says that uh, there will have to be a vote taken for the, for the uh, majority of the people benefiting the residents prior to the construction as far as the noise barrier, because from um, other neighbors that has those noise barriers, they say they don't work, they look awful, and it's, I'm wondering, because they were out in front of our house digging holes, saying this is on the wall. So are we going to vote on it or are we not going to vote on it? Yeah, so, so, so how that works is there's, and I think they mentioned that, there's noise analysis that's done. Um, and then we, it's really up to the neighbors and majority rules kind of what, whether the noise barrier goes in or not. I mean, I can tell you, like, in, in the Toledo area, um, we get a lot of calls um, for noise barriers, and um, the, there is data that shows that they do work too. So I just, uh, it's kind of up to the community whether they want them or not. And, um, you know, if you guys don't want them and the majority agrees with you, then there wouldn't be a noise barrier going in that area. So I, I don't know if you want to talk more specifics. And that's, and that's fine. And I just have to find my last question. It says, our steering committee met with Representative Josh Williams. He stated that he would reach out to your office in Bowling Green to attempt to organize a meeting between I 475 Neighborhood Coalition Steering Committee and ODOT. The Neighborhood Coalition agreed, but ODOT refused. My question is why? So we did hear from Representative Williams' office, and I will say that I did not actually perceive it as a request for a meeting. We provided them with some information, and we did not hear anything initially. So I will sincerely apologize to the group for that not orchestrating in the way that it did. But we provided information about it and told them of the upcoming meeting, and that was the end of the correspondence with the office. So I will accept that in my public information office as the reason that, that meeting did not come to fruition. But I would also say that I. I falsely interpreted their request if they were requesting a meeting at a specific time or to come to a fruition. So I, I do apologize for that. But we did give Representative Williams' office. He absolutely did contact us, so I will say that as well. Okay, so I was sitting in here because you were actually next. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first, I have a comment uh, for the coalition members that are here and also for the members that are not or people who are not members of the coalition. Uh, please notice uh, when you go to the voting booths that there are no elected officials here. There are no elected officials at our 100 plus meeting that we had at the Sanger Library. And this is tragic. Uh, my question is that I've been working in industry before I retired as an engineer, doing some uh, smaller capital improvement projects. Uh, we were writing anywhere from 5 to 15% contingencies for those projects, okay? You guys are looking at 30% uh, contingency, which is factored first. Then an additional 24.1% uh, escalation factor, okay? It, it strikes me because of this, this woman's question that, okay, what are we going to do with this knowledge thing? That all this escalation all this contingency because you don't know yet. Okay? Now, this is not necessary by any means. And what you're talking about here is padding this construction, which is already around $186 million, of an additional 61.3%. And folks, that's on our backs, okay, as taxpayers. Can you answer why this contingency and this? And this business with escalation is so high. Is it because we're at 50,000 feet? Will you narrow that back down as we get closer? And then what happens for the overruns? To, to address the percentages you were talking about, uh, you know, given the space, we're really on, as, as Pat mentioned, we've come down to 20,000 feet, but it, it is customary in our industry to assume about a 30% contingency at this point. Many of those unknowns is underground unknowns, such as the closed drainage systems and utilities. 
um, that will be uncovered throughout design as we get into more detailed design. We do want to anticipate those costs. And then, you know, historically, the last three years, we've seen historical uh, inflationary rates. And ODOT does have a calculator that we use in the industry as a standard. And when we put it at the midpoint of construction, so that would be that um, mid-2028 to 2029 time frame, the escalation is about 24% uh, given today's rates. We've seen a historic um, increase in inflation, especially when you talk about asphalt and oil products, steel, um, getting that material. The, those are historic escalation rates. So we are required to anticipate those based on the information that we have. So that's where those numbers are coming from. The full 61%, that full number, okay? That's correct, yes. Uh, why don't you just say how much it's going to be with all that instead of say, 186 for this, 24% for that, 30% for this. Just tell us how bad it's going to hurt up front. How bad could it hurt up front? We have it bad. Yeah, again, that, that, is, that is how these pressures are estimated. Some of the other issues are, like, like you said, with inflation. When you're looking at like a vertical construction, for example, and your company, uh, you, there's a lot more knowns than unknowns. So that's part of it. When you're doing a horizontal construction, and you're starting to get into geotechnical issues, and you're starting to get into, um, you know, soils. You're starting to get into underground utilities, things like that. There's just there's a lot of unknown. Uh, but there's also you're not when you're doing vertical construction. Generally, if you're a company. I mean, you can get a vertical construction done fairly quick, right? I mean, we, we this might not you know we might be looking five six years out. And, uh, and that's where that adds a lot more risk to that. It adds a lot more risk to the estimate. And that's also why we have those contingencies in there to account for that risk that where you would see a private sector, I, mean, I don't know a lot of private sector places that are thinking seven, eight, ten years out. They are, but they're not actually like, if they're ready to build something, they're going to be usually a lot closer to building something, if that makes sense. All right. Jason, I go ahead. I just because we're we're yes. taking just to get back to your 186 number, the contingencies did lead us to that number. <coughs> I'm not sure if that's uh, where you're going to question. I thought those were on top of that. They are not. That's included with. So the 186 includes the 30 percent contingency and the 24 percent escalation. Does it include property tax? At a high level, but that, that will be determined as we go through the process. Does it include the design costs? It includes the design costs. Yep. Can you, can you, can you those? those will get more refined as we move on. And just like what we said, we're coming down. So as time goes and we go through the processes and we get closer and closer, just like with anything else, trying to say when you, you worked with uh, Sir, when you worked in construction. You get closer and closer to that that time when you're bidding something out. Those those estimates get more refined, and there's less contingencies in there as you progress. So that's that's part of the process. And we can continue to we can further discussion, but I'm going to go ahead and move it along to the next question. Thank you, gentlemen. My name my name is uh, Mom Rainbow. I live on uh, Queenswood Boulevard. Clearly within the noise area of the 475, but a bit of ways in the time. I just uh, took a road trip with my wife, got out to Denver, and came back, spent some time driving through Chicago, and I can tell you that it's almost laughable for me to hear you talking about congestion here in Toledo. I mean, you want to see some congestion. Take a look in Chicago. Now, uh, yeah, people are mentioning other places where there's some serious congestion too. We are so uncongested on 475 that people are traveling far in excess of that posted 60 miles an hour, or posted 65 in other places. Have you given any thought to actually having the 60 mile an hour 
post the speed limit in Florence. Yes. If it were in Florence, there would be virtually no difficulty in getting onto the expressway. In fact, there seems not to be much difficulty getting on now, according to the statistics that the uh, 475 Coalition put together. I was looking and I saw that uh, there's something like in the last three years, six uh, accidents from merging, and I think uh, one accident from somebody leaving uh, the expressway. Uh, that hardly justifies, in my judgment, a uh, whole new uh, configuration for 475. Now, one thing that uh, I just heard, I think the term I may have missed it, was a reserve lane. Here, I'm sorry? Uh, 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 auxiliary lane, and you mentioned that there would be an auxiliary lane between Palmage and Secor. Now, am I to conclude from this auxiliary lane, which of course wouldn't be necessary at all if people took the, uh, the regular streets, use the street lane, and you're not going to save a whole lot of time by getting on the expressway if you're leaving uh, Palmage and getting off at Secor. I mean, we do have a street grid, and cars do actually go down the street grid. So, my question is, are you so concerned that there's not sufficient congestion that you want to actually try to create more congestion with the creation of auxiliary lanes? All right, so I'll start off uh, maybe answering the first question in that group of questions. Uh, uh, the speeding issue, um, and, and we do have the same concerns with speeding. Uh, we uh, are not able to enforce the speed limit. Uh, that's left to our local law enforcement officers. Um, I will say that, that, okay, we have the same concerns in this corridor. I talked to the State Highway Patrol, and uh, their comment, they had a couple of comments. Uh, one of the comments was that uh, there really isn't a good spot to sit in this corridor and be able to clock speeders. Uh, the other comment was that they don't like to pull speeders over during the day because uh, it causes congestion and backups on 475, so they they uh, don't, I guess, enforce the speed limit here as much as they would like to. And, and our thought is with this project, that with winding down the three lanes, that will provide more space, excuse me, more space for uh, for them to do their job uh, enforcing the speed limits uh, throughout the corridor. And I'll turn it over to. Uh, Okay, uh, we do have, actually, we have four right here, so we're going to go one, two, three, four, and then we'll loop in the five. And I see still a number of hands, I just want to remind the panel as well, and the folks who are asking your questions, that we have 20 minutes remaining for the room. So to kind of take that on what that gentleman was talking about, 86% uh, of the crashes from 2019 to 2021, uh, according to your data, were due to speeding. And I, I'm, I'm just talk about that a little bit, but um, I'm wondering what alternatives there exist to reduce the speed at which people could travel or reduce the speed through uh, design changes instead of widening it, which you guys know, we know, more people will be able to speed. I mean, again, again, we see a lot of it's enforcement issue, and that's where that's a issue. That's a issue. Right. So a lot of it's enforcement issue. Um, we we made improvements to 475 and 75 in other areas, and uh, it it is being enforced in those areas. Somebody asked in the last session about my uh, question was about design. About design. Yeah. Not enforcement. Yeah. What, part of what, what the design is is trying to come up with its current standards exactly what the uh, presentation show. Um, again, we're trying to address those merge uh, issues as well as the off-ramps, uh, which are tight. I mean, I drive this area. I mean, it's it's very tight. You don't shut the interstate rather quickly, I, I believe. But, but what alternatives, what design alternatives are there to widening, to lower the speed at which people can't travel? Yes. So again, we're, doing, we're not raising the speed limit. The post is speed limit. Right, right but design. I'm talking about design, not enforcement, and not post. Choices that you guys can make to reduce the speed at which people 
aren't able to travel. They travel on the Exactly. There are youth in residential areas and, and business districts, and it's because the, you know, the, that's, that recognition of the principle that a wider area, more people need to see, more people need to do goofy things, and there are kind of complementary in place. Like there are in uh, standard ministries, residential areas, business districts, people will slow down. Because that's what the uh, yeah, no, no, appreciate the follow up. Yeah, and I, I think the gentleman that just spoke kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, each type of roadway has a different set of applications. And what we're talking about here is an interstate facility where, you know, some of those measures that might be used in a residential neighborhood or in a more, um, you know, local street residential setting just simply aren't applicable when you're talking about an interstate. Thank you. We are going to move forward with it. Sir, we have many number of people who would like to ask questions. Thank you. We're going to continue, so I may have Thank you. I live near the westbound ramp off Douglas Road, off I-75 on the Douglas Road. Uh, there's an engineering notation on one of your current project maps. Uh, and the notation, which was added in 2020, says that ODOT constructed that ramp in 2012 with a design deficiency. Okay, so that's what I'm concerned about, is design deficiency. So, two related questions. Why was it built with this deficiency? And since you previously constructed roads with these kinds of deficiency, how do we know that your proposal, your current proposal, uh, does not include more of these deficiencies? So, oftentimes, there are no ways that are built, we'll say, with the design deficiencies to an extent. It's, it's called a design exception. And oftentimes that's in, included in a roadway for, uh, to avoid right away takes, for example. Or perhaps there's an element in the roadway that cannot be moved. Say there's a water tower that, that feeds the city of Toledo that cannot be moved. We'll have to make exceptions to those rules. We'll, do, we'll put in safety measures additional signage or elements that will help facilitate the direction of traffic through that, um, what we'll call design deficiency. Um, we do go through an extensive process uh, to get approval, and we do make uh, advancements elsewhere, we might widen the shoulder, for example, so that you can see better. But there are some areas that will remain constricted, uh, so we'll come up with options to do that. Now, everything that we've laid out to date, right now, uh, meets or exceeds design criteria for this corridor based on the layout. You know, so those ramp ramps that we've designed, uh, vertical curvature, site distance, those elements that we are required to look at and are meeting all the design criteria that is put forth uh, through the state of Ohio. Thanks, Jason. We have our next question. Hi. Um, my main concern is phrase no total takes I understand you're not going to be doing any complete home taking but no total takes inherently means we're going to take something from somebody and my concern is the neighborhood between Talmadge and Quarry Road Springbrook to be exact that's my neighborhood and it joins up Quarry Road and Talmadge Road those people can ill afford to lose any more of their property to the ODOT walls. There's some of them uh, that have maybe 20, 30 feet, if that, and you're going to be taking more of it, so you're going to get, render your property worthless. Nobody's going to want to live in a house like that. And then uh, across the, the uh, expressway, there's a, I don't know the name of the road, but there's a road running along their front. And uh, how are they going to have access to their homes if you bump out those walls to take that road? They, how are they going to get to their homes? So at a high level, Spring Brook, and I think the other area you're talking about is Imperial. Yeah, yeah I believe so. And for Springbrook, 
uh, just from memory, what we're looking at you there will not impact property. Uh, we will be widening the interstate. We'll have our team walls, but again, there was noise walls, the sound walls that are in place today will be likely there again. Again, that goes to the process of public involvement and if the community doesn't want those walls, if they are warranted. Um, so I do, I do believe from memory that Springbrook, uh, there'll be construction, but they're not taking additional right away to that area. Uh, Imperial, uh, we are coming up with a solution that um, during construction will likely, Dave talked about temporary easements, that we would likely need a temporary easement. We would accommodate access to a couple of properties that don't have driveways in Imperial, but the intent is that we would <coughs> replace the roadway as it is. Um, there would be a sound wall like there is today with a barrier, uh, and you'd be able to maintain access on Imperial once we're complete. Hey, Jerry, you have a question from Pat here? Hello, my name is Pat Um One question about the traffic count. You showed the picture of the traffic counting machine. Is that showing all four lanes in that period of time, or is that the traffic count just westbound or eastbound, or how, how is that figured? Yeah, great question. That that counter is picking up data across all of the lanes of 475. Okay, so that, that the number that we have then is over four lanes, and that's for a day, right? That's correct. Those so those numbers so are for a day. that by four to get it for each of the four lanes, and then divide it by 24. I'm looking at it by an hour. Then we get some sort of a mag maximum count per hour. I'm sure that's way below <coughs> that limit for that item. So when you look at 24-hour data, it's going to fluctuate over the course of the day. So in the middle of the night, there's very few cars on the highway, whereas during the daytime, when people are out and about, it's going to be higher. So that is a total for the 24 hours, but you can't exactly equate that to what the, the peak so hour would be. What I was pointing towards then, and you're helping me with that, I think, is that the congestion situation has an hour or two a day in each direction. It's not 24 hours a day. It's only for those morning and rush hours. And if that's the case, do we really need to wipe the whole damn highway just for that? No. Uh, I'll leave that with you. But now the other one is uh, the Federal Highway Administration has looked at that and they've indicated what they think are the delays that the trucking industry might experience going through that interstate <coughs> so the trucking industry can their time to wreck their trucks to go the best route for them. And they're only talking about three and four minute delays going through that period of time. It just doesn't seem like it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars to correct that. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. Thank you, Yes, I thank you. Uh, this gentleman has been waiting a long time. I, we're doing our best. We've got about eight and nine and a half minutes left. So I live right behind Autonomous Interchange. Wall's about that far from my house. First statement is the walls are junk. They don't work. They don't, they make it louder. The laws of physics proves it because you built a wall across high sound boxes. That was, we'll leave that statement there just so for your engineers that didn't think physics. Second, your own data shows what you put up there in the map for 2045, only section that was red was between Talmadge and Seaport. Uh, Everything else was orange, yellow. What that proves is you need to figure out something. The ramps is what the problem is. That's the only area. Not the whole highway between point A of Romedico Parkway and 23. Most accidents, because I sit there and listen to it, because nobody enforces the law to the speed limit. We already covered that. And they can't cover it. They can't enforce it because, oh yeah, your walls. We'll leave it at that also. But I'd like to explain why your map for 2045 shows there is really only one small, one mile section of red. Thank you, Mary. I don't know if you had anything you want to specifically mention about the map or projections in 2045, um, but we do thank you for your comments. All right, thank you for keeping your hand up and your patience. 
Uh, my name is Allison Burfeck, and my husband and I purchased a home um, was a year ago in May. Um, we are heavily invested in our property. I'm sorry. Um, if our backyard is at I-475, if that wall moves into where you have it on your map, it will be 45 feet from the back of my home. If I follow the wall from where you're putting the post in down at Dublin Hill, it will come 10 feet into my backyard. Um, I don't feel that we've had enough information. I mean, I found out about this on Saturday morning news, and, and that's poor. Um, I looked on your website. I know that you did, I'll, I'll call it a data dump a few weeks ago. Um, not on one of the thousands of pages were any of the stakeholders or steering committee members listed. I don't know how you expected us to answer, to ask any questions of anybody. I mean, we've been searching for answers all over because we don't know what we're going to do. Um, I know that Michelle Grimm um, provided us with stakeholder and steering committee member uh, names and there's names on there. Um, well, I have it down here, actually. Some of these people don't even live around here. They don't live in Ohio. Um, there's a person on here that is listed. Um, he moved to Sacramento, California three years ago. There's one that lives in Chicago, one that lives in Atlanta. I don't know how, well, to me, how is someone else living across the other part of the United States making decisions for me. Um, and to me, it's either it's really sloppy, it's fraudulent. I mean, all the scenarios are scary. So my question is, is how do we get a hold of these stakeholders and, and why aren't any of the neighborhood residents that are going to be affected part of the stakeholders other than the politicians that are listed. Yeah, I can answer that. So um, when it comes to the stakeholders list, I believe there's 70 some odd stakeholders. Uh, when we look at that, we're trying to get a represent, representation of community again with churches and, and, and elected officials, they're, they're voting for. Um, but we're also looking for other organizations too. And I've talked to some people after the last meeting, and we love representation from any other organizations out there as well. Uh, when a specific when you're talking about the like out of state folks, there's only two that come to mind. Although again, like some of the churches, uh, I, I, somebody mentioned to me earlier that a rabbi might have moved on. So we have to make sure we update those lists, and, and the lists are actually out there. So like, you know, I would love for people to go through that and be like, hey, there's a new person here. We will do that as well. But it's just easier to know if you're going to this uh, synagogue or church or somewhere else. Like, let us know. Um, but having said that, I think two of those were, one was the Norfolk Southern representative, and the Norfolk Southern, we are actually doing something to their bridge, so that's why they would be a stakeholder. Uh, and then the other one was, I think it's ADM? ADM. ADM is, I think, one of the only, maybe the only company that's using that Norfolk Southern line, and they would be disrupted because of this project. Um, so, again, those two entities are one of the two of 70 some odd stakeholders and uh, again if there's other organizations out there we'd love to have them too but they're stakeholders because of uh, the facilities that this project will impact directly with directly with their assets so. but why weren't any of the stakeholders um well, anybody from any of the neighborhoods that, that are truly going to be affected i mean you're talking about businesses but we're talking about a whole lot of houses that are in that corridor on i-475 yeah, I mean, right, and, and again, that's where we're looking for representation, and that's where, you know, generally you guys are electing city council people or reps or things like that, but also the neighborhood, uh, and I talked with uh, a couple people earlier that uh, talked about the opposition group, and they, it sounds like they're, I don't want to speak for anybody out there, that they're more than happy to be on that, uh, serve on that stakeholder group, so. Um, hopefully they provide their names and we'll make sure we add them to it. 
And we then I guys recognize that the properties that you live in, your homes, are assets and are valuable to you, and that's why we really charge our consultants to minimize this number from, from, from 50 to zero. But we do have two more questions that we want to get through the free walk. How do you expect us to live with a wall 44 feet from your back of your house? My name is Ruth Clinton. I am the pastor at Christ Presbyterian Church located at the corner of Sylvania and Talmadge. I think by definition that makes that church a stakeholder in this conversation. We are um, be between uh, the Talmadge exit ramp um, and, um, and Sylvania Avenue. Um, this has a great impact on us and it has a big concern in terms of ministry um, in the neighborhood where we are located because we do back up to uh, Jadeway and Graceland and um, that's a concern to us. Also, um, I want to say thank you for the information that you have provided. Um, I am not an engineer. There are a lot of good reasons for that, mostly because math is very hard for me. Um, but I do understand um, that tools for living have a life unto itself. And so um, while I have many, many questions about this, and I think there's a lot more information to share, would somebody please speak a little about um, the life of a standard highway? Um, I will tell you, I was born in 1971, so I have never known a time in my life when those highways and their particular configuration did not exist. And coming back home after more than 30 years away, adulting in other parts of the country, um, some of the changes that have been here have been very uh, disconcerting to me, but I also am aware that those design changes and updates are required because um, the life expectancy of the highway system needs to be addressed. Would you say something about that? Thank you. And I'll refer to the group. Um, and we do have one more question, but if you guys want to work on answering that, chat here, and I'm coming to you for the final question. Okay, great. You guys Yes, just addressing the life expectancy of a highway. Uh, typically, you know, we look at anywhere from 40 to 50 years at a maximum. Um, as we talked about earlier, this project was designed and constructed in the 60s, so we're beyond that life expectancy. Um, and ODOT does a very good job of maintaining their facilities. So while the pavement on top may look very good, um, that underlying support structure is getting beyond its useful life and very soon we will have to do a complete replace, replacement of all that pavement um, and, and I think we've extended the life beyond what is typical for this segment of, of interstate. That's what would provide the opportunity to upgrade to the current standards through that research over the years that we've gotten to this point and, and that we're held to as a standard um, by the Federal Highway Administration. So that is Alright, we've got one more that we're going to be here and I think we're going to wrap up with that. Thank you. Yes, it's, uh, I'm uh, again uh, right around the Spring Brook area as well and I'm one of those that have invested quite a bit in my home as well. And so obviously this is concerning to me. Is there any data from uh, when a, a, a project like this has been done of what are we expecting as homeowners? What's the ramifications of all of this? I mean, uh, part of this, I was thought, well, should I stop taking care of my home as much? Should I just get out before you know the information gets out about what's already going to happen? Is the damage already done? I mean, I've already thought about calling realtors and that kind of stuff. So all that kind of concerns me uh, where I live and stuff. So is there any doubt to this? The ramifications of being a homeowner? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not necessarily aware, it, when you're looking at it, you're, the, the 475 there is going to be widening it and addressing some of the deficiencies, but we could also be making some improvements in the neighborhood with this project. Um, so I'm not aware of any actual data that's out there one way or another, um, but uh, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not aware of that data. It might be somewhere, but uh, um, again, I'm not aware of it. 
Thank you. I'm going to wrap up here in the back for a final question in front of the group. I do believe that they're going to be packing up with the boards up front. So if you wanted to have one last glance at the boards or talk to anybody that's up front, we encourage you to do that as soon as possible. Um, but we're going to take this as our last question in the forum, and then we'll still be sticking around for a couple more minutes as we exit. So I might have missed things because I came in late. But there's two roads that run along 475 on the west side of Douglas. Are those being eliminated? Or as I know previous times they were talking about being eliminated. And those bridges they put in from Medica all the way to I think Bowen. When were those done? How many millions of dollars did we spend on those? Yeah, I don't know the exact number that we spent on those. Uh, we basically redeck those bridges so they're not as previously as 2019. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know the exact date. I mean, I want to say 2017, so we're there. 17. Uh, but those two roads that are on along 475, yeah, we plan on keeping those. There's no uh, uh, thoughts or plans to remove them. Um, and again, those bridges uh, we probably need to quite and hard uh, replace all those bridges to, to accommodate the extra lanes on 475. So. Okay, well, we thank everyone who has come into the choir state for the question and answer session. We know that we have not answered every question. Um, like I said, a couple of us will remain here, but that we are made accessible by phone, by website, by different common forms, different common options. So we encourage you to stay participating. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you.